Good evening. I am Lou Wagner, trustee of the Donald and Esther Simon Foundation. Our foundation is proud to partner with the Zeckelman Holocaust Center as a program sponsor for tonight's event, Getting Away with Murders Behind the Film. As a child of Holocaust survivors, I believe in the importance of honoring the memories of those who perished. The portrait of my parents, Rose and Julian Wagner, hangs on the portraits of honor wall behind me, along with those of other Michigan survivors. Each year, the Holocaust Center welcomes tens of thousands of people. Visitors engage in an educational experience that is sober and empowering and helps them make connections to their own lives. By learning the lessons of history, visitors understand they have the power of choice. They can make a positive difference in the world. At the Simon Foundation, we are proud to support the Holocaust Center. By educating each new generation, we can create a better future free from anti-Semitism, hatred, and prejudice. I am honored to introduce David Wilkinson, the director, writer, and producer of Getting Away With Murders. In addition to serving as chairman of Guerrilla Films Limited, Wilkinson is a writer for various screenplays and print publications. Thank you, David, for your tireless efforts to bring this important film to the screen. It was a travesty of justice that so few perpetrators were prosecuted. We must learn from this history to prevent it from happening again. After David's presentation, our Q&A will be facilitated by Mike Leibson, a former Oakland County Assistant Prosecuting Attorney and current docent at the Holocaust Center. Please type your questions in the Q&A section located at the bottom of your screens. Welcome, David. Hello. Um, I'm hoping this is all working. And um, thank you for watching the film. It's taken a very long time to get here. Um, I'm not sure why. I, I consider the lack of justice for the victims in the Holocaust to be the greatest miscarriage of justice in, in the history of mankind. Something that people would actually challenge me, which is kind of extraordinary. And I, people ask, when, when did this idea come to you? And it's, it's hard to know. I was born in 1955. My father caught the tail end of the Second World War. My grandfathers, both of them, fought in the First World War. So it's kind of within your DNA if you live in the UK and you're of my generation. And I used to, at the age of very young, there was a television series called All Our Yesterdays, which looked at what was happening in the United Kingdom 25 years before. And I would watch this. It's, my parents thought it was very strange for a, a child to watch. And so it's always been with me. And, and the idea was there bubbling away. And somehow it, when you make documentaries, you come up with ideas every day and you think about them. And after a while, most of them you discard. But this one kept being there. I, mean, just, it, I just couldn't fathom because every now and again, we'd hear, read in a newspaper or the television um, news bulletin about some other Nazi that had been found. And you know, particularly when I was young, I couldn't understand it. You know, why, why weren't they all prosecuted when the war finished? And so it was bubbling away. And then in um, 2003, um, Ronald Harwood, Sir Ronald Harwood, he, as he became, he was he liked being called Sir, he'd been knighted by the Queen because he said, I'm Jewish. <laughs> so few Jews are ever knighted. And he loved it when people called him Sir Ronnie. And um, he just won an Oscar um, for The Pianist, which had been very hard to get off the ground. And when it first came out, nobody went to see it at all. And Ronnie said it was the Oscar nominations that got the interest. He, you know, they kept being told the, the Holocaust, there's no new stories in the Holocaust. They've all been told. It's the same thing that people bleat out all the time. Um, and I was working with them on a, a, a distributing a film called Taking Sides with Harvey Keitel and Stellan Skarsgård, which was all about whether Willem Furtwängler 
who'd been the conductor of the uh, Berlin Philharmonic, whether he was a Nazi or not. And it'd been a very successful play and it was made into a film. And I said to Ronnie, because we drove around the country and, and uh, because Harvey Keitel and Stan Skarsgård were not available. So, um, as a, you know, I didn't want to intrude on him and things because he, he wrote more about the Holocaust than anybody else I knew, either as a film or a play or an article um, and sometimes a book. And um, so I asked him one day, I said, look, I've got this idea and I'm, I've not spoken to anybody about it. But I'd like to make a documentary exploring why so many of those who committed the murders were never prosecuted. At the time, I thought it was like, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent, you know, which was pretty large. Only, of course, when I made the film, did I find out it was 99 percent. And I said, what do you think? And he said, I think it's terrific. He always had this word he used, terrific. He said, that's such a good one. And I said, do you think it's a problem that I'm not Jewish? And he said, no. He said, I, I think that's to your advantage. He said, because, because I'm a Jew. And, you know, when I do something about the Holocaust, you know, I know that people say, oh, he's only doing that because he's got an axe to grind. It's, you know whatever he said you're coming at this fresh that Ronnie found out which I would also discover that there's a, a number of holocaust denying websites mainly on the dark web but some of them are on the internet and they talk about the Spielberg lie and they say have you ever noticed they said all, all documentaries are made about the holocaust they're all made and financed by Jews you never get anybody who's not a Jew so Ronnie thought as did I that that this would be a great advantage so with his endorsement, I mean, you know, you can't get, for me, you, you couldn't get any better than Ronnie. I set about trying to make it and I was never going to be directing it because I, at that time I wasn't a director, I was just a producer. And the, also at the back of my mind, I kept thinking, and Ronnie thought the same, that somebody else must have done this. I mean, it's such an enormous topic. There must have been a film or television series. So that held me back for quite a while when I did research and it was still early days for the Internet. And I just couldn't find anything. And then I came across something that Steven Spielberg's sister made called Elusive Justice, which for whatever reason was only in, released in the United States. I couldn't get it here at all. And I finally found a copy in America and somebody sent it to me on DVD. And that wasn't that similar it, it, it hardly strayed into my territory so armed with this and this you know by now great I, I was very angry I mean I was driven by real anger and um I just thought it was extraordinary we, we live by the rule of law um and I thought that this was staggering that we just allowed this to have gone on and so I went to try and finance it. And I went to all the broadcasters, not just in the UK. I went to American broadcasters, German broadcasters, French. And everybody turned it down. And it was extraordinary. People would either say, you know, really crass things like, oh, the Holocaust has been done to death. I mean, you know, that, that was by a leading employee of, of one of the UK's top broadcasters. And... Um, you know, another person, when I tried to pitch it to him a second time, this was at somewhere called Docfest, which is in Sheffield in England, which is a very important documentary film festival. And they have lots of commissioning editors there. And um, his whole thing was, well, I don't understand why you want to make it. He said, you're not Jewish. Why, why do you have this passion for it? And I just couldn't understand it. And I was just getting nowhere. I mean, about 1,700 people were contacted, not just by me, but by lots of other people involved. And um, the um, there was an there was an interest. I can't say it was totally. Um, Greg Phillips, who's an executive producer on this, and he, he has spent 50 years of his life selling films and television series around the world. And obviously, Greg is Jewish and knows the story well. He would talk to broadcasters. Um, so it sort of removed me from it. And people going, yeah, I think David's got something really interesting here. But he spends too much time at, 
after the war. Why can't he have more about the rise of Hitler? And if you can get Hitler in the title or Nazis in the title, then that really sells. And I don't know if many of you noticed, but I don't actually have any film or photographs of Hitler in, in the production. I was very adamant that he was never going to appear. I was, I have to mention his name. And that really depresses me. Bec and you just have to look at what's been made in the last five or 10 years. You know, somebody's made a series called H Hitler's Sex Life. I mean, they make that, that gets funding and I don't, uh, I have to go to private sources. Um, and I was just slightly in despair. And then I was, got on board uh, a London bus and I hardly ever get a bus. Whenever I'm in the center of London, I walk everywhere. And I had a big black hat on, enormous black hat. And my beard was mu m you know, much fuller than it is now. And I had a big black coat on and I had black shoes and I had black trousers like I'm wearing today. And uh, I got the last seat on this bus. It started to rain, which is probably why I got on it. Um, and then on the next stop, this man got on. And even though it was the end of October and it was quite cold, he was wearing a T-shirt and I could see he was a bodybuilder. He was, he was great, enormous muscles. He was carrying what I thought to be a gym bag. And as he came back, past me on the bus he said shalom now i looked very like frank latchman who's my accountant who lives in tel aviv and is an orthodox jew and i didn't think about it i didn't think what i was wearing because he said shalom um one of my great friends gary phillips greg's brother uh who i've known for like 30 years and gary often greets me with shalom and i didn't think anything of it and i just said shalom back to this man and then for about 60 to 90 seconds and he was tall I was sat down his great muscles he just attacked me this this kind of vicious verbal attack about what a dirty Jew I was and why was I killing Palestinian children it was all down to me that they were dying and this this these tropes you know the same things coming out all the time and I, it was quite frightening, something I'm re rarely ever, an emotion I ever feel. And I just got angry and I stood up and I said, I'm not Jewish, which I really regret doing. And I went upstairs on the bus because we have double deckers in London and he didn't follow me. And that was shocking. But what was really shocking, I mean, really, this was a crowded bus. And it was full of British people, going, Londoners going home or wherever they were going. And as he came out with this stuff, everybody was looking in their phone or they're all looking out the window going, oh, what's that going on here? Everybody's looking everywhere but at me. And I thought that's how it was in Nazi Germany in 1930s, in the early 30s. And everybody turned their back. And suddenly what they might have thought was shocking then give it two or three years, and they were joining in. And I got off the bus and I rang um, Don McVeigh, who's my DOP, that's the cameraman. And I said, Don, I, I've got this film. I've had this idea for ages and, and I, I just got to make it. I just have to make it. Will you help me? I've got no money. I'd had a, I financed most of my films and my previous two films had been sold by a company called Q Media and they'd sold them all over the world. And so I'm the main funder of both these films. And then they went bankrupt uh, before I got a penny. And so money that I was expecting to use for lots of other things, a lot of money. So I didn't have much. And I just started filming. And, and um, I thought if I start, then I should hopefully get people to join me. And I got a, a Jewish gentleman who doesn't want his name to be known. And he gave me 20,000 pounds. He lives in Hampstead in London. And then a man called Aziz McMahon, who's a sort of Irish Arab, he gave me some money. And then Neil Phillips, who is a South African Jew whose um, family got out of Lithuania in the 30s. Um, he gave me money and I sort of, it started to trickle. I, I was always running out of it. So that was a bit of the strength of the film is that I could film, I'd run out of money and then I'd start editing. And, and I had this very long gestation period where I could think about 
what did I want to tell? And then luckily my wife is the costume designer of a, a Netflix television series called The Crown. And she came in with the last bit of money that I needed. But even so, it was very difficult. And, and there were lots of people on my side. Um, and, you know, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, if it wasn't for them, I had somebody work out a budget of uh, what it would be if I was paying the normal rate, if I was making it for Netflix or, you know, Amazon or someone. And uh, they came back with, they said it's somewhere in the ballpark of about £185,000, which is $200,000, and uh, two hundred and I think it was £24,000, which is about $250,000. And I just didn't even have that to make the film. So um, if it wasn't for them, uh, and a lot of people like that, and, um, you know, I just never have finished the film. And it, I, I just still to this day, I can't fathom why broadcasters think that making something about Adolf Hitler and the rise of the Nazis it's far more meaningful than than making the film I made. And even when I'd finished it, it was very hard to interest me. I'm a distributor. That's a huge advantage I have over most filmmakers. So I've released well over 100 films in the United Kingdom in the cinema on DVD online. So I know how all that works. But I still had a problem because I had to, it was very important for me to come out on the 1st of October 2021, because that was 75 years to the very day of the sentencing at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. So I thought this was perfect. And because I hadn't finished until the end of that July, it was too late for me to get it into cinemas. And because it was this epic film of three hours long, so many cinemas that I'd worked with very closely over the years, they just said, we can't do it. There's still the pandemic's still on what few cinemas were open, they're all taking the bond because they'd all lost such a lot of money. So cinemas that would normally have taken my film, they had eight screens all showing the new James Bond because James Bond is the biggest franchise we have in this country. And they needed, they desperately needed that money. So I understood it. And there was, there is a strange thing that, and it, it just makes me so cross is the way that there is a perception that the Holocaust has been covered. I mean, you know, there are six million plus stories there. Um, you know, Malka Levine, who's in my film, she's writing a book of her. Her, um, how her family survived the Holocaust is unlike anything else I've ever heard of before. And there's just so many stories there. Uh, and it, I don't know whether it's laziness or what it is, but what happened? So. They'd all rejected it, everybody in, in broadcast. And the great thing was, is the critics in the United Kingdom, I thought they'd really go for me because I'd made a much longer, for, uh, not quite as long, but I'd made a long documentary some years ago with, with Sir Derek Jacobi. And they'd had a go at me because it was too long. And that was only two hours long. This was three hours. And what was fantastic is that all of them, uh, the reviews were extraordinarily good. I mean, the, the Guardian newspaper, the, there is only one uh, film list in this country that everybody, every filmmaker wants to get on, and it's the Guardian newspaper. And um, they voted the film is the 17th best film in the UK of 2021. And by the most extraordinary uh, luck it was also the highest rated documentary so in their eyes it was better than the summer of soul which won the oscar last year so that that really helped it's the first time in my 53 year, year career where critics have really got behind it and m almost all of them man and woman uh said that there was so much in there they hadn't seen before and because that was the assumption that I was getting from all kinds of people that, oh, we've seen it. Yeah, the Holocaust. We've done, the Holocaust's been done. Let's move on. Let's go on to something else. And, you know, so many, e even in my country, which is a first world country, I'm staggered by how little 
anybody knows something so important and it's not really taught and my cameraman who's a very intelligent man he's about 43 now so he was just becoming up to 40 when we went around the killing fields and i remember him saying to me when we were in lithuania he said i, I just didn't know he said i thought that everybody that was killed was killed in in the in the camps he said i knew nothing about all these other murders and it's starting to change now i mean very late we have already one holocaust um memorial museum in Nottingham, nottinghamshire near sherwood forest which is in the film and there's somebody building one uh in the lake district uh the the lake district is a very beautiful part of the united kingdom in the north obviously with lots of lakes and even after the war the british government were pretty they let all these Nazis in, but they were very funny about letting children in who'd survived the camps. But they let in 300 children from Theresienstadt and they went to the Lake District in Windermere and they became known as the Windermere children. It's a very good drama film you might be able to find somewhere you should see. And it was just about them um, assimilating to a sort of normal life after going from camp to camp to camp. So they're building a, a, a wonderful museum. One of the um, uh, Windermere children is in the film, Eric Hirsch. And um, so hopefully more children will go. The great thing, the British Board of Film Classification, I've worked with them very carefully over the years, and I know what the requirements are. And because people couldn't understand why I was very angry. And I toned a lot of this down in the film. At earlier voiceovers, there was an aggression and, a, and an anger that I took out. And I thought, no, I'm going to alienate people if I'm... Uh, and, and the same with Dame Eileen Atkins. I felt she just had to be very matter of fact because it, it somehow seemed more shocking. Um, and uh, I can't even remember where I was going with this. Um, oh yes, the BBFC. So um, I wanted something really shocking for people to understand why the lack of justice was was appalling. And so I have a shot. I don't know how many of you saw it at the end. And I thought about this for a year because my I didn't have that much money. My um, editor kept going off and doing other work, and. So I, for a year, I, I thought, do I include it or not? And it's, you see a dead woman. There's a, there's a long shot and then there's a close-up of the same shot. And lying beside this dead woman is a little baby. And this little baby, it's, has got an umbilical cord coming out of it. And these, they, just killed them because they didn't want anybody as a witness. A woman that's just given birth and a newly born child, they murdered it. They These cowards murdered these children because they didn't want any witnesses. And I, I so I knew, I absolutely knew that's an 18. That That is so shocking, an image that they would give me this 18. So I was preparing a case to put to them that I wanted a 15. Um, so anyone above that age could go and see it. And I'd watched La The Last Days, which Steven Spielberg produced. And I looked at a lot of their footage and they had some similar to what I did. And I spent like a day with Emlyn, who's my co-writer working on how we would, um, you know, the, the case we'd put for the defense, if you like. And to my surprise, they came back and they said, uh, gave me 15. And I rang up one of the um, people that worked there and had an off the record conversation with him. And they said, yes, absolutely. You have lots of footage in there that is an 18 and shouldn't really be seen by anybody under 18, but we've contextualized it. And we think that your film is so important and how you've used the film is so important that we thought 
it had to be a 15 because it has to be seen by children, by, you know, obviously not young children, but they really wanted it to go into schools, to go into universities and for people to learn. And um, I've now been talking for a very long time, so I will hand over. All right. Uh, good afternoon from here and good evening to you, uh, David, and thank you for attending today. Uh, once again, my name is Michael Leibson. I'm a volunteer docent at the center here. And in a prior life, I was a federal prosecutor for some 33 years, so I have some interest in this material, obviously. Um, I have some questions I'd like to begin with, and then if anyone has any further questions uh, from out there, they can put them in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many as we can by the end of this. Uh, let me see if I can phrase this correctly. You talked about there being 6 million stories, and there are. The problem is, to me, those 6 million can't tell their stories. They're dead. They're, they're not like the survivors who can tell the story. And unfortunately, to the extent that they show up, and they do show up in your film, they're nameless people in photographs just before they died without names. Yeah. It's something very interesting that a lot of people will not do and have not done. There's a piece in there where you're showing these awful photos from a massacre on a beach in Latvia at uh, Lipaya, I believe is L-I-E-P-A-G-A, I believe. Yeah, Lipaya. And one of those photos shows several women in their underwear because they've been forced to strip, having their photos taken by the killers. Now, a lot of people have seen those photos and it's just what it is. It's four or five women about to die. But you, somewhere along the line, discovered who their names were and you put them in the film. Why did you do that? And does that make those those pictures even worse? Um, it, I think it's very important to know who people are um, because it, it it's like when I do my whole thing of walking around Yorkshire, six million is just a number. I thought, how can I contextualize this? Um, and I think it's very important to know as many names as possible because then they become a person rather than just an image. Uh, the, the trouble that we have in the modern world is we're bombarded with images all the time, whether it's the, you know, what's happening in Syria and uh, Turkey at the moment or in Ukraine. And it's it's when you know a name, it's when you know something about that person that I think humanizes it. And I just thought it was important to find somebody else found them, I, some unnamed historian has found those names. Uh, I didn't go off and do a huge amount of work to find them, but I just thought it was, uh, it, we needed to put some names to some of the people that we had in the film. So I think that's absolutely correct. And I thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I know you traveled through a good chunk of Eastern Europe to make the film and met any number of people there. How did they react to the project once they found out what you were doing? Uh, the difficulty was always Lithuania. I've been to Lithuania a few times and there is a bit of a rewriting of history uh, in that country. I mean, it, what's very interesting is when all three Baltic states decided they wanted to become part of the European Union, something that my country has rather foolishly left, um, the Israeli government sent a delegation to either uh, Brussels or Strasbourg and they said look if you allow this you've got to put into legislation that they admit what they did to the Jews in the war and the EU looked at the case and they said yes they must and so I assume it was written down in legisla legislation so a lot of these sites that have come up in those Baltic countries um, have come, not so much the Panerai forests, which we feature, have come because of this um, obligation to tick that box with the EU. But they've only gone so far. So when we uh, arrived at La Paya, there were suddenly a lot of people there to greet me in the, at the location. And I don't know who they all were, but they all wanted to check out what I was doing and everything. They're all obviously Lithuanians. And then 
they disappeared. They couldn't stop me filming because then as the UK was a, a, a European country, I was allowed to work there and film. And because Robin is a very distinguished broadcaster, rather than Don and I drive him around, which is what we did everywhere else, I, my old business partner, Gary Tuck, who's from Detroit, um, he now lives in Vilnius and he uh, is a line producer, works on series like Chernobyl and things. And he, uh, for no money, fixed everything up for me. And he found me a driver and he found me a local sound man. And they lived all their lives in Vilnius. The sound guy was in his 50s and the driver was in his 30s. And I don't know how long the, the signs, every 250 yards, there was a sign saying um, Panerai Forest Memorial. And so you see all the way from the centre. And they not only had never been there, they passed it loads of times and they'd seen the signs and they'd sort of slightly wondered, what, what's all that? But they'd never heard about any of this and they didn't hear about anything at all. A anything, Everything I told them was new to them. And when we filmed in um, the Kaunas, uh, the 940 in Kaunas, and where Robin's grandmother had been murdered, along with 137,000 others, Robin read from Jaeger's own report in his own handwriting. But he'd, Robin had translated it from the German. And he said, and I was very lucky to be able to find lots of willing local participants to help us in the killing of the Jews or whatever. And Robin reads that to me. And when it had finished, I, I wanted to set the camera up somewhere else, I said to Don. And this man came running over and he said, Robin, you've mistranslated it. And Robin said, really? I'm surprised. What, what have I mistranslated? He said, you said that Lithuanians were willing, you know, participants. And Robin said, yes. And this guy said, no, no, we were victims. The Nazis killed us. They were awful. You know, we didn't kill any Jews at all. And Robin said, listen, you need to go and visit all these websites. And he put them on to, you know, various websites and all the information. And this man, late 40s, early 50s, he was really shocked. So what was really, really pleasing for me is the first sales I made, the first people to broadcast was a company that broadcast to all three uh, Baltic states. And this film is available on the equivalent of Netflix over there, unlimited for the next seven years. So there will be people there who didn't know the story and will hopefully watch and learn. I see a uh, question from the q and I wanna add that to a question I had here. The question is what happened to the perpetrators of the Holocaust by bullets? And uh, let me segue into that by asking you about your interview with Ben Ferenc, the prosecutor who prosecuted the major Einsatz group and folks in Nuremberg. So if you combine those two things, what was it like to uh, talk to Mr. Ferenc? And how does that bear on the question of the uh, perpetrators of the Holocaust by bullets? Um, I'll answer the second question first. I mean, you know, it, it's. Uh... They were the ones that are in the UK. So there are 400 Nazis living here and my country seemed to not think that was a problem. Successive Labour and British, uh, Labour and Conservative government, left and right. None of them seemed remotely interested. And they were the people that did the mass murderers. And as, as you've seen, the only one who was prosecuted was sent to prison for killing 18 Jews, which was all by bullet. And in reality, it, it's well over 100. But Anton Gekas, who features a small amount in the film, he was a mass murderer. And even, and there was a case brought against him because somebody made a documentary in the 1980s or um, um, stating he was a mass murderer. It was a television documentary. And he was so arrogant, he took the broadcaster to court. And Scottish law is different from English law. And the judge threw the case out. And so what the judge was really saying is, I'm throwing this out because I believe you to be a mass murderer who shot vast numbers of Jews, believed to be in the thousands. Um, and um, he, uh, and what did the British government do? That's tantamount to this judge, a very learned man saying, you should be in prison and they do nothing. So, uh, 
vast numbers of those got away with it, possibly more than the people that served in the camp, because the people that served in the camp, you could find a paper trail because of the obsession that Germans have with keeping records. So you had been able to go and find them much more easily than you would the others. Ben was the hardest person to get into the film, other than Eli Rosenbaum, who obviously I never got in the film in the end. And um, Ben was, you know, not sure what I knew. So when I I'd fixed it up, I was originally due to film him at the end of March 2020. But um, my one of somebody who did a small bit of editing for me on the film, uh, John Suriano, who's an American uh, from New Jersey, he and he works in risk management. He said, David, uh, you, you've got to you've got to film Ben like as soon as possible, because there's this thing in China, this kind of bug. And I think it's going to be a problem. And I went, it's just flu. What are you talking about? So he persuaded me and I I persuaded them to give me the last day in February. But Ben, ben grilled me. It was really fascinating because I got in there, just wanted to know what I knew and what I didn't know. And so for the first half hour before we filmed, he was like a prosecutor. What do you know about this? What do you know about that? And I really liked that. Um, and I filmed with him for um, an hour and a half. And as you see, he broke down. The, the woman who was filming with me has filmed him many, many times. She's a friend of his, uh, Sharon. And she said that in all the times she's filmed him, he'd never, you know, he'd never been emotional before. And, you know, the 17 minutes of him in my film, I filmed him for 90 minutes and I could have used all 90 minutes, but the film would have been very long. And I came home with it and um, then the pandemic happened and I was really upset because I was still trying to raise more money to do more filming because in my head, I wanted to film in Israel, Ukraine, Russia, um, Eli Rosenbaum. I wanted to go to Canada. I wanted to go to uh, Sao Paulo and I wanted to go to uh, Buenos Aires. And it was in that sort of when we didn't know what else to do. I just sat looking at my rushes over and over again. And I realized that once I'd got Ben, I had a film. If I'd not got Ben, I'd have been in real trouble. So he's in many ways, he's the linchpin to the entire production. And I, I just, I'm just so grateful that, that John taught me into filming earlier because I wouldn't have been able to go in the end of March. So that, that sort of, that sort of luck I had never, never with the money, but things worked out really well like that. I think somewhere in the film, you made a comment that, or somebody did, that there were roughly 3,000 members of the Einsatz group and approximately only 200 of them had been actually prosecuted. I think which answers part of that question about what happened to them. The answer appears to be not much. Oh, no, very little. I mean, again, it was it was hard to track them down. I mean, obviously, some of the ones were uh, Martin Sandberger and uh, um, Otto Ohlendorf, who um, Ben brings up in the case. I mean, what was, you know, I just couldn't get over the... Martin Sandberger, when Ben told me that he didn't think he was uh, he committed genocide or mass murder. And, you know, when Ben questioned him, said, well, how many did you kill? He said, well, I only killed 300 to 350. And in his mind, that wasn't genocide. That wasn't mass murder. I mean, that's extraordinary. And he he died in a, in a luxury hotel with an awful lot of money. And he doesn't appear to have done very much work. Um, so he obviously, you know, got very rich by killing Jews. I know, uh, again, from the film, you visited an awful lot of these sites. I have visited many of the same ones. And I know on these tours, there's some point where you get overwhelmed. There's something just hits you that is emotionally difficult, if not impossible to deal with. Did you have any such uh, moment like that? Um, in a strange way, no, I did. But most of the time you divorce yourself from what you're doing. And because I'm also writing in my head and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say and I'm trying to work out how I'm going to shoot it and all of that, you're there to do that job of work. For instance, when we were going near the, the pond with Lucas and I said to John, let's go up there. It looks rather pretty with the sun coming dappling through. 
And then he tells me this shocking statistic that there's probably 40,000 bodies in there. But I had two things. One, it wasn't. Lucas was originally never going to be in the film and he he didn't want to do that before we'd gone there. He said, no, no, I can't be in it. I'll show you around, but I won't be in it. And so I'd worked out with Emlyn. I don't write that much in advance, but I realized I had to do something with Auschwitz. So we wrote out about four or five sections. Uh, I, I, I would write them. There's only one remains in the film. I would write them and send them to Emlyn. He'd work on it. I'd come back to me and work on it again. So really a lot of thought had gone into those, but I didn't really want to do that. And when I started to deliver them, I was overwhelmed. I was just stumbling and stuttering and dry in the mouth and really couldn't get it out. I'm very, I was very fierce, very angry, very aggressive. Um, and I suddenly, it suddenly dawned on me that I had this huge responsibility to tell this story and to do it. Could I really do it well? Could I actually, you know, this, nobody else had told it before. And, and that was just really getting to me. And somehow Rory, who was the sound guy, he put a mic on Lucas. I don't know how he did it. And this it wasn't working my doing to the camera i did a couple of them and then i thought i said to don let's just and i'd seen that he'd put the mic on him and i said let's just talk and i talked it over with him and and that was really very useful but it was when we got to auschwitz one and there is a gas a, a, a gas chamber and a small crematorium there it's, it's nothing like what they had in auschwitz two but, and Lucas said, look, you can film in there, but you can't talk. That's all we ask. And I went in and Don and Rory followed me. And um, I just, I was so overcome by that. And I, I went to Don and I just put my hand over the camera and said, we can't, you know, and I, because I couldn't speak. I just said, no, cut it. We, I, I just couldn't. I, it, if I'd have filmed there, it would have just been so disrespectful because that, you know, that somehow because they've they don't exist other than as a pile of rubble in Birkenau that I didn't have the same effect. But suddenly when you're there, it's it's a chilling feeling. It, it's it, it you sort of feel you, you really. Yeah, I was just very moved by it. Um, we do have a question here. It deals with scientists. Um, I'm not sure if it's asking the same question I'm going to ask, but it's, what do you think, was it proper for the U.S. to use those Nazi scientists and engineers? I'm thinking particularly of uh, von Braun. Or uh, would it have been better if he'd have been prosecuted, jailed, and had never done what he did later? Or anything, or people like him? Um, I've always found that to be a red herring. In this country, it was always said that they helped MI5. I mean, these were illiterate farmers and laborers in this country that came and and i think it sort of gets in the way because the vast majority that lived in your country and lived in mine they they were nothing to do with anything yes i mean i would have prosecuted them i would have you know i, I know you know it, it all helped with the space program and everything and i just i don't agree with that is that you you can um you can sort of not forgive them, but you can forget what they did in order to, to, but that's politics, isn't it? I mean, you know, they can, I, I mean, I wouldn't have done it. I mean, I would have absolutely prosecuted. He, he was the perfect person in a way because of a very strong case against him. And he was a Nazi, um, a member of the party. Yeah, I'm assuming that the uh, part of the US government's thing was obviously getting the rocket technology and preventing yeah. him going to the Soviet Union because we're talking Cold War now. Yeah. So anyway, um, in a conversation I've had with you, you mentioned there's something, I don't know if you call it a flaw or a little problem nobody's noticed in the film. What is it? Yes, it's it's strange. I, people then notice it when I mention it. And that is, I don't really cover what the Soviets did. And what happened is I was in Moscow in 2015 
I had a, another documentary of mine playing at a festival over there. And I started to make inquiries. And even with Jews, you know, Russian Jews, I was saying, look, I want to cover about what the Soviets did after the war in prosecuting. And everybody would go, oh, we don't know anything. Um, no, you know, you go to people, history professors, and they go, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't know anything about that. I'm not sure anything did happen. And I thought this was really peculiar. And I, it was like an old Cold War film, is that um, a lawyer had obviously heard what I was saying. I was, you know, when I would do my talks and things afterwards, I would ask people, I'd ask anybody while I was the four or five days I was over there. And he took me to one side and he did that thing of looking to see who was listening and making sure that we, you know, did it where there were no microphones or anything. And he said, look, he said, um, Putin changed the law. And there are certain things that are illegal. You cannot talk in Russia about to do with the Second World War. And he said, the problem is, is that none of us quite know what's illegal and what's legal. And he said, that's why you're going to get no one speaking to you. And, you know, I was just closed down at the Moscow um, Jewish Museum. And I thought, this is really strange. So that's it. There is a there is a flaw there that I it, it, I would have liked to. Um, and I did find somebody in Milwaukee who is a great expert on this and obviously an American. And she but it, the pandemic was well into it then. And she um, was vulnerable. And I didn't want to do it as a Zoom interview. I would have had to go over and film her. Uh, and we just didn't know when that would be. But she has a lot of those answers. When you're talking about the Soviets, for what it's worth, there is a question that I've only seen in one book by Yehuda Bauer, is what were the Soviets doing in that 21 months after they invaded Poland in those lands that would become the Holocaust of bullets later? And it's an interesting story of how the Soviets were essentially destroying the Jewish communities differently than the Nazis, but definitely making it much easier for the Nazis when they came in. So... Um, Oh, absolutely. And the whole cat in massacre and things with right, all. Exactly. I mean, they that's what I would have liked to have explored. And that's that's the hardest thing to find out the truth. Um, but the Soviets have got very funny because after the wall came down, everybody made a beeline to the KGB building in in Moscow because that had the largest archive of Auschwitz records than anywhere else and it was all, there were all kinds of things there so i've spoken to many historians and then over the years they closed all that down as well but yeah i i you know that's part of that you know a lot of people are rewriting their history um this whole thing the whole film is premised on the fact you know, it is a fact that justice was not done to the victims of the shoah but I suspect that perfect justice isn't possible. I mean, I think you mentioned at one point that there were about a million killers, of which perhaps 1% were prosecuted. That's yeah. 10,000. That's 10, that's a large number. And the question is, to you perhaps, if you thought about it, since perfect justice wasn't and isn't available, what would it have looked like? If all these countries had done more, what would have approximated justice? Is that even possible? Uh, th there is never perfect justice, but you have to try, because if you don't try, then we've stopped living by the rule of law. And I can only really talk about my country. I can't criticise other countries because I'm not a citizen there. And we knew they were here. And as comes out in the film, it was a combination of anti-Semitism and we can't be bothered. They were all, you know, it was in other countries, um, is we we had the ability we had the money um to prosecute a lot of them, those people it, it sends out a very important message um and we just never had the will and if it wasn't for philip rubenstein and uh the all party war crime committee uh, they would we would have never got that one prosecution but all those people worked for decades to bring that about and we prosecute one person and it was an easy to prosecute. I mean, yes, they did have to take people over, um, you know, 
abroad to look at what he did and all of that and and it cost i think 6.4 million pounds um which is probably about 20 million dollars today but the money is not the important thing the justice or seen to be doing justice and you know i i do this whole thing in the film which you know i'm outraged by why do we go after uh william joyce lord haw haw who's an american citizen he can't have committed treason he lived in ireland and you cannot prosecute an American citizen for treason because they haven't committed treason about the United Kingdom. It was because there was such hatred for him because of his broadcast. Yet real murderers, real mass murderers, were allowed to wander the streets of Edinburgh and, you know, Nottingham and Manchester and things. And that's, we should have done something. So, yes, we won't get it, but we should have really tried. You know, in the film, you highlight, I think it's around 17 individual Nazis and their like who got away with it. I assume you considered others. Surprisingly, how many more did you look at? Um, and how did you choose this group? Well, I brought Emlyn into a lot of that. So uh, Emlyn's a writer, a very established writer, and he has the handicap of working with me because the, the whole narrative is mine. I know what I want. I know the journey I'm on. And so he's not really gets involved in that so with things like this i gave him lots of names and he went and did lots of research and you know together he would come up with a short list and then i would work on it so we had that core list of people and from time to time as the editing you start to shape a film you know it's a bit like sculpting something so when i Originally, I went to film Malka Levine about something else, and she didn't tell that story very well. We didn't capture it. So I ended up doing something else with her because I filmed her for an hour and a half. And because when she talked about Joanna Altvater, then I had to have Joanna Altvater in it. So she became one of the people that Day Mylene reads out the statistics. When I knew I was going to Delray Beach in Florida, I thought we've got to find somebody a Nazi who was living in Florida. And so there were quite a lot of them. And uh, I uh, chose Fedor Fedorenko because he was eventually caught and prosecuted by the Soviets. So he he ticked lots of boxes there. I wanted people who had got away with it. I wanted people who'd been captured. I was also very keen to have people that were bumped off by Mossad. Um, and then there was also the one that's caused me the most problems when I showed it in Washington, D.C. at the Jewish Film Festival there. An historian pulled me up on it about Walter Ralph. And uh, he was a mass murderer and he worked for the early incarnation of Mossad. And then they helped him escape to South America. So he was a very controversial figure. And I knew that it would be, I had no idea why they did it. And I got his details originally in a book I read, written by a former Mossad agent. And then Ha Haaretz had written a very good article about him. And I think possibly the Jewish Post. So you have to cross reference everything all the time. But it was, yeah, it, I mean, the. the the difficulty was choosing which ones because there were just so many. I wanted a whole mix of them all. Now, the film you did was three hours. I know when you film things, you have hours of film that don't show up uh, in the finished product. So uh, I assume there are many things left out. Uh, what kind of things would you like to have put in? And is there some possibility you will use those materials in the future? Um. I'm very, because again, having no money, because I'm a producer as well as being a filmmaker, I'm always thinking economically. So I didn't actually film that much. There were some scenes I shot in London, which was, a, it was linking Albert Pierpoint, who was an executioner to all these people. It was a very left field thing. I didn't use that. And I filmed in Sugihara House in uh, Kaunas, who was a man who helped a lot of Jews escape there until Japan joined the war. Um, so I didn't. I mean, the only thing I cut down were all the interviews. So everybody who features in it was like one and a half to two hour interview. So that's all that you keep. But I there was a thread that I started and it was going to be part of the film. 
and that's to do with all the theft the theft of houses the the also the insurance companies a lot of um people who were killed took out insurance against their lives against their houses against their p possessions and they still stood and after the war there's a man sam dubin in florida he's been fighting for decades to try and get those insurance companies that have all become very rich with all the money they took from these people um trying to get them to recompense either the the survivors in decades gone by or their heirs um and i covered in the film billy joel his grandfather very interesting case in Nuremberg, who was forced to sell his business for a fraction of the price and would eventually go to court. It took him eight years and he did get recompensed. He built what became the largest mail order business in the whole of Germany. And so that was in the film. But when I started to edit that, I suddenly realized that that's a separate film in itself. So I'm now doing a sequel, although I don't call it a sequel. Um, and I particularly I'm very, very angry about all those companies who became monstrously wealthy by employing slave laborers, laborers for seven, eight years. Mercedes, BMW, the people that own Krispy Kreme and, and Pret-a-Manger, all of those people who, um, you know, if you're employing like Mercedes, 48,000 people and you're not paying them and you're working them in many cases to death. And you're working them. All day and all night. Um, that's how you've made your wealth and very few of them have ever owned up to it. They've very little compensation. So that's what my whole sequel will be. But I just hope it's not going to be another 18 years to raise the money because of my age. And I want to film some of the survivors. And, and that's, you know, the tragedy, as I mentioned in the film, they're all coming to the very end of their lives. And, and you know, there is this thing I had it all the time people said oh David you'll have no problem raising your money all the Jews are wealthy I know an awful lot of Jewish people I have three four very good friends who are Jewish <laughs> none of them have any money um that and, understand. yeah and and uh, <laughs> you know you just look at the majority of people if you kill six million I, I believe the amount of wealthy Jews was very small but e of even the poor have a possession they have something of value, whether it's a gold tooth, whether it's, you know, there's something. And when you're fleeing a country, when you're being told to leave your home, you take those possessions with you. And, um, you know, the 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 museums of Europe are stuffed to the gills with uh, looted Nazi treasures and private collections and things. And it's said that only about 20 percent of all the what was stolen has been recovered. And there's lots of people working very hard to do this. And so I want to explore all that. And I want to really have a go at lot. I won't be popular. I'll never be able to go to Germany, but that's what I'm now trying to find money, but it'll be equally as difficult. It's, uh, as you know, almost impossible to end a discussion of the Holocaust on anything other than town, anything other than yeah. sadness. There was one, I think, awful thing in the movie to me, and it gets back to the comment you make about the Lithuanians. And the comment was this, for the Germans, 300 Jews were enemies of humanity. For the Lithuanians, it was 300 pair of trousers. Yeah. Is there to comment any further on that? I know it's a downer and awful way to end something, but this we're talking about the Holocaust after all. Um, it's strange because, I mean, if you watch Ken Burns films and I watch a lot of them, he, he has these clips, li little snippets from letters and quotes all the time. And I had intended to do a lot more of those, but it sort of got in the way. Um, but that's the only one I kept because it. I just thought it was so powerful because that's what it was. If, if you when you go into this um, and I make a big thing of all those people who said, oh, we had to kill the Jews because we were invaded, you know, nation and we had no other alternative, which is just such nonsense. In Lithuania, 
um, they were pulling them out of the houses two to three months before the Nazis arrived and they were killing the Jews. They were clubbing them with whatever they could find. And, you know, women and, and children and men, all of them, just dragging them out. And they were just moving into those houses and keeping them. And that's part of this next documentary. A lot of those houses are still owned by Lithuanians. They've been sold and resold and sold again. So if any of people listening to this, if you have a foundation, contact the museum because I'd be keen to talk to you. But it is, it just never ending. I mean, it is, it is extraordinary. Uh, and it's, in many ways, in a strange way, um, when money comes into it, it's even harder. It's it's almost as if a lot of these people, they don't care about the number of people that were killed. That's sort of irrelevant. Um, but when it's that painting on your wall, that was taken by your grandfather and that belonged to my mother and I, I can prove this. And then they suddenly care. It's funny how possessions and money um, sort of talks and then they'll fight tooth and nail to keep what isn't theirs in the first place. And meanwhile, you know, particularly Israel, I want to go and film in Israel because uh, a lot of those uh, survivors there have very little money. You know, they're, they're struggling to pay medical bills and for food and things and um, if they were able to get more compensation. One, uh, one I more have question. A... If I... Oh, go ahead. I have oh, one no, I just... question. Yeah, sure. Uh, somebody wondering, uh, what were the most important books or films that you read or watched to prepare yourself for making your film? Um, I didn't. There's a, there's a book I must read by David Cesarani, who is a very learned um Holocaust scholar that worked for the Wiener Library, the Wiener Holocaust Library, as it's now called in London. And I've had that for about 15, 20 years, and I've never read it. Uh, because, And that was the great thing with Emlyn. Emlyn would read books. I would, I would like to look at papers. I would like to look at what people had left, what they had written, what they had written after the war. I, I liked reading what Holocaust survivors wrote many historians wrote because I didn't want to come to their conclusions so David's book it's called uh, Justice Denied I must read it but I thought if I read that then I will either avoid certain conclusions he came to because I go oh Pete I don't want to be thought I've got that because I've read his book um, and I just don't like the influences so I, I watched I've watched Shower obviously um, and originally, my original cut of Auschwitz and Birkenau was Lucas talking to me for eight and a half minutes. And I, I wanted no footage in there. I did it with another editor. And um, John, who's the editor and works a lot in television, he said, David, yes, it might work for the cinema, but eight and a half minutes with no footage, nobody else talking. He said, television's going to hate that and at the end of the day you're only going to get a mass audience from television so I changed that but I tried hard what once I once I decided I was made I was from about 2015 I was determined one way or another to make it so even if I hadn't suffered from an anti-semitic attack even though I'm not Jewish um I I wouldn't have um I would still have made it somehow it's a sense of time, you know, time is running out. All right. Uh, David, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for making the documentary. Several of the people in the Q&A have commented on that and they also thank you. Uh, if you haven't already seen Getting Away With Murders, the film is available to watch on Amazon Prime, Peacock, Roku, Tubi, and XUMO, however that's pronounced. Zumo. If I, if I can just come into that, this is another important thing. This is why I'm glad I had people who donated or lent me money like my wife, because we've given that film away. So Amazon paid no money for it. Peacock paid no money to be. I'll get something at the back end. 
we thought all of us that made it wanted as wide an audience as possible. And if we'd licensed it to Netflix or, you know, one of those other, you know, Paramount Plus or something, that means a very small audience could watch it. So apart from Amazon, any person living in America, Australia or Canada who wants to see it can watch it for free. And that's brilliant. We don't have this sort of multiple platforms um, giving away things free online in this country that you have. And I think for anybody that's doing anything educational, this is wonderful because people will watch and know that they don't have to pay. And then they might start watching more. You know, they'll watch it out of curiosity and hopefully they'll learn something and they'll keep learning by watching. Thank you again. Uh, I do want to thank also our sponsors, the David R. and Esther Simon Foundation and the PNC Foundation. Uh, for those listening in, uh, please join us on Wednesday, March 8th for our next program titled, Where Are All the Women Untold Experiences from the Holocaust? Uh, this is to commemorate International Women's Day and it's a free in-person event. Our speaker is uh, Katie Chaka Parks, who is a PhD candidate at Wayne State University. She is manager of adult education here at the HC and in my opinion, is a rising star in the field of Holocaust education. And it's gonna be a great, great presentation. She will illuminate the untold stories of women during the Holocaust and acknowledge that their experience were different precisely because they were women. So you can learn how to register at holocaustcenter.org. And thank you all so much for watching and have a good afternoon. And David, have a good evening.